How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the Reading is for Nerd show. I'm your host, Josiah Nerdquist. 2020 is finally at an end. As far as years go, this sure was one of them. I'm not going to say that 2020 was a dumpster fire of a year where absolutely nothing good happened like some of my Facebook friends want to believe, but I will say that I've heard the term unprecedented times used more this year than any time before in my life. So in order to reflect on some of the things I've learned this year and end the year on a positive note, I wanted to recap the books that I've read in 2020. In total, I read 29 books this year. I thought I was on track to reach the nerdy 30, but evidently my reading skills are better than my math skills. As the title of this video implies, I'm not going to be looking at every book I've read this year. That would just make the video even longer than it's already going to be, and some of the books I just didn't have anything to say on. If you're curious to see all the books I've read, you can check out my page on Goodreads and follow me there. The only thing I like more than reading is having a website where I can show everyone how much I've read. I'm just going to discuss the books in the order that I read them, and again, you can go to my Goodreads page to see my ratings for all the books. One of the first books I read this year was Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, a pretty popular book, so you may have heard of it. Um, the title of the book comes from Theodore Roosevelt's Man in the Arena speech, which is still super relevant today, and I encourage you to look it up if you've never read it. Uh, and the book itself is all about vulnerability and learning the right way to be vulnerable. I found especially interesting Brown's explanation of how shame is typically rooted in different areas in men and women. In women, it's typically rooted in physical appearance, and in men, it's usually rooted in masculinity. And I get that. After that, I read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Every year for the past few years, I've tried to read a classic literature book to show everyone how cultured I am, and this year I read The Jungle. The book follows a family of Lithuanian immigrants as they try to live and survive in Chicago in the early 1900s. And for as bad as 2020 was, I'm very grateful that I don't live in industrial era America. Because this book is good, but it is depressing. The main character has just dealt blow after blow, faces loss after loss. And it's a great reminder of all the blessings we have with modern day technology and freedoms. After that, I read What Made Maddie Run by Kate Fagan. Maddie Holloran was a 19-year-old track and cross-country runner at the University of Pennsylvania who in 2014 tragically and unexpectedly committed suicide. She was pretty, she was popular, she had her whole life ahead of her, and from the outside she looked happy and healthy, um, which just sort of makes her death even more tragic. The book shines a spotlight on the mental health crisis in America and also gives insight into the pressures to succeed that college athletes face and just the pressures to always be happy that young adults face. It's not an easy book to read, but it's a story that everyone can relate to in some sense, and I think everyone needs to hear. Pivoting in tone, the next book I read was Everybody Always by Bob Goff. Goff is an eternal optimist. I read Love Does last year, and it was the happiest book I've ever read. And Everybody Always is the same, except in my opinion, even better. Goff is the world's most interesting man, church edition, and he just has so many crazy stories to tell. Um, he's hilarious, and he always finds a way to see the positive in every situation, which I like. He also is really good about tying every story back into his walk with Christ, which uh, is super cool. If you're trying to get into reading or back into reading and you don't know where to start, this book or any other book by Goff is an excellent entry point. Next, I read Night by Elie Wiesel. This short memoir recounts Wiesel's persecution as a Jew during the Holocaust. While the subject matter is dark enough on its own, Wiesel is very much a poet, so his description of his experiences isn't just dark, but it's also just haunting and heartbreaking. Again, not an easy read by any means, but I think choosing to learn about subject matter like this instead of ignoring it is the healthy and responsible thing to do. After that, I read The Five Love Languages Singles Edition by Gary Chapman. Everyone knows about the love languages, so as far as like necessary reading goes, this isn't on the list. The book just gives a bunch of different examples of what it looks like to love someone with each love language. So unless you have no background information with love languages, uh, it's really nothing groundbreaking. My love language is acts of service, so if you help me move, I will literally die for you. Next, I read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. This was my second time reading through the book. I read through it with um, my small group and I love it. C.S. Lewis was a man ahead of his time. His take on heaven and hell and all the reasons why humans will choose the latter over the former is fascinating. And his just observations of the human condition are beyond anyone else I've ever read. 
This book is super convicting, but it's also super short. So I encourage anyone who's trying to grow in their faith to read it, especially if you have people that you can read it and discuss it with. After that, I read the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. by Martin Luther King Jr. My two brothers and I have a book club, and this is one of the books that we read together this year. We were also reading this book around the time that George Floyd was killed and all the protests were happening. And it's just crazy and sad to see how much MLK's words about racial injustice in America still apply today. His letter from Birmingham jail, which is in this book, is one of my favorite pieces of writing, and it's particularly convicting to Christians who feel like they have no role to play in the fight for social justice. He was an incredibly discerning man who even in today's climate still offers wisdom that I think everyone needs to hear. The next book I read was The Future of Humanity by Michio Kaku. I wanted to feel smart, so I read a science book. Kaku talks about the near and far possibilities of humans settling Mars, creating self-replicating robots, traveling faster than the speed of light, and eventually harnessing the power of every star in the galaxy to become a galactic empire. It all seems far-fetched, but we live in a far-fetched world, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it, um, and I learned a lot of big words from it, like transhumanism. The next three books I read I'm going to group together, and those books were The Lie and Six Days by Ken Ham and A Biblical Case for an Old Earth by David Snoke. Back in August, I was talking to a girl, and out of curiosity, she asked me if I thought the age of the Earth was measured in thousands of years or millions slash billions of years. I said I had never really thought about it, but my gut said millions slash billions of years, to which she disagreed. She asked if I would be willing to read some books on young Earth theory, and I said yes. And so she recommended The Lie and Six Days by Ken Ham. I also picked up a biblical case for an old earth to either confirm or deny my gut response. I read all three books over the course of a week, and in the end, I can confidently say two things. One, I still believe in old earth theory. And two, Ken Ham is one of the most pigeon-brained authors I've ever read. The rhetoric and logic he uses in both books, which, mind you, contain 75% of the same content, just spit in the face of scientists, biblical scholars, and competent-minded people alike. He just says the same things over and over, gives himself the most lowball questions when playing devil's advocate, and ultimately talks about the age of the earth as if it could lead people away from the faith and how it should divide Christians. I pulled a muscle from rolling my eyes so much while reading it. Meanwhile, Snoke's argument is scientifically, biblically, and logically sound, and his book reads a lot more like the work of a scholar than Ham's, which reads more like propaganda. I don't know how old the earth is, and really I don't think it matters that much, but Ham's take on everything just left a bitter taste in my mouth. After that, I read Gospel by J.D. Greer. This was my second time reading this book as well, and if I could only recommend one book off this entire list for you to read, it would be this one. As someone who grew up going to church but never really understood the why of it, Greer breaks down what the gospel is and how it should affect every area of our lives. The gospel, which is Jesus' death on the cross where he bore our sins so that we may know God the Father, is an ocean that is infinitely wide and infinitely deep. If you think you've heard enough about the gospel or know enough about the gospel, you don't. This is a great resource and should be at the top of everyone's reading list. Next, I read Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. I've now read this book twice as well, and I liked it a lot more after the first read through than after this most recent read through. It's a pretty popular book and Eldridge's definition of masculinity is pretty controversial. Some people swear by it and some people hate it. I like a lot of the overarching points he makes about how men long for an adventure to go on and a battle to fight, but ultimately it feels outdated even with the revision and updates. I think it was written for a younger audience, which explains why I liked it so much more a few years ago. It's still a good book with good takeaways. I just don't agree with everything in it like I used to. After that, I read Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. This was another book I read with my brothers, and I really enjoyed it. It's a book for business people, of which I am not, but the principles in it can be applied to any facet of leadership. While I don't believe that Sinek is a Christian, his explanation of how sacrificial leadership leads to greater happiness and reduced levels of stress for everyone in an organization is very biblical, and I hope that the people who have more power than me who have read this book were taking notes while they were reading it. The last book I read this year was Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. I read this book as part of my internship at my church, and it sort of slapped me across the face. I'm a man with a lot of ambition, but not a lot of discipline, 
so I'm not great at sticking things out for the long haul. But this book reminded me that the Christian life is the discipline life. Reading your Bible, praying, spending time in worship, evangelizing, serving, these aren't just things that the holiest of Christians are called to do. It's what all Christians are called to do. Following Christ isn't just some spontaneous spiritual experience. It's a journey marked by intentionality and discipline. One of the last chapters of the book talks about learning as a spiritual discipline for the purpose of godliness. Although not as integral of a spiritual discipline as Bible reading or prayer, Whitney says that learning and growing in knowledge is something that should mark every Christian's life, especially learning through reading, which is an excellent thought to end this video on. If you're not a Christian, then reading is beneficial, but if you are a Christian, then reading is essential. I encourage you all to let 2021 be the year where you start reading again, because despite the fact that reading is for nerds, it's fun and it'll help you grow in your walk with Christ. Let me know in the comments any books you read this year or recommendations you have for me to read next year. If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe. I appreciate you all and I will see you in the next one.